David, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining us. It's been quite a year. G'day, Michael. It's been quite a it's year, not David. Just the, oh, the whole world's gone mad. Um, you know, I noticed you, you didn't mention that madman in, in Russia who uh, should get whatever the, the, the um, award is for the worst person of the year. Uh, who would have thought there'd be a major land war in Europe propagated by a nuclear power? Yeah, yeah, right. Um, and then, obviously, you've had uh, China still shut down with its COVID strategy. Um, you've had ramifications locally in terms of, as I said, an activist government. It, it is, we are living in, and then inflation out of control internationally. You've lost, what, two prime ministers in Britain. Um, it seems to be all very odd place. Do you think it's going to calm down next year at all? Well, that depends on what sort of values governments uh, return to. Um, my view is that the symptom of all of this is that governments have tried to do too much for too long in a way that's not responsible to people's actual needs and desires. I mean, you go through it. and invade it, Dictators invading other countries, central banks printing too much money, uh, governments trying to lock people down and putting in place overly draconian vaccination uh, rules. Uh, you go through each of these failings, uh, the fact that the Prime Minister told kids not to go to school for three months and some of them still haven't gone back. Uh, you know, what we need is a return to limited government doing a few things that only government can do well and letting the rest of it uh, up to people in their communities to run their water supplies uh, run their schools, run their politics for that matter, um, and have and have some local control over things like fresh water. So the, the question is, if, if governments keep trying to centralise power and idealise our futures and remake us in their image, uh, then things are going to get much, much choppier next year. If we see a return to limited government that's responsive to the people, does a few things well and doesn't try everything else on, under the sun, then I think we have a very positive future. OK, uh, which all suggests um, at the end of this particular year, um, when I look at your poll rating personally and also as a party, that you're going to feature very prominently uh, next year, obviously, in the election. One of the things that's interested me is that Labor's, uh, both Nationals' vote and yours, have stayed up. In other words, there always used to be the theory that ACT cannibalised National, and when National retained or started to retain support, you would lose it. That hasn't happened this year, has it? And look, it, it's been a really tough cup uh, for commentators who like to write off ACT. I almost feel sorry for them. Uh, they always assume that it can't last. You know, they said our caucus would be a rabble of... You know, uh, to borrow yeah. a phrase, they, yeah. they probably said they'd be a basket of deplorables. But actually, uh, you know, having someone that runs a, a water blaster, a humble water blaster from Christchurch in the <coughs> form of Tony Severin, a rural wide dairy farmer, uh, a publican from Nelson who runs a pub called The Honest Lawyer, um, you know, this <laughs> ragtag basket of deplorables have actually turned themselves into mighty fine MPs, and, and that's before you start looking at some of our more senior MPs like Brooke Van Velden, uh, who's been named first MP of the year. So I feel sorry for the Dowsers, but the, the, the team of performing, we've got more good candidates uh, coming along. Um, and I think what the Dowsers have missed is that actually, you know, there's a lot of people in New Zealand who like to make, uh, they like to achieve. Uh, they may not go along with all of the Ponsonby Road social trends and they may not always get their pronouns right, but they're still good people and they're still thinking people and uh, you know, they unite and act. And I think that that is a positive thing for New Zealand because this country is built at least in part on people who travelled a long, long way to build a better life for their kids. Uh, that aspirational vision, you know, maybe we don't get all our pronouns right, but we still do things right by each other. That, that, that's the real New Zealand for me, uh, and I'm proud that we're starting to get some of that spirit coalescing under the ACT banner so we can get some real change next year. Yeah, uh, I think the other thing I noticed about ACT was that when you weren't getting media coverage, um, you decided to go on the road, particularly last year. Do you think you're reaping some of the rewards of that as well too, David? Look, this this year as well, I mean, we've done over 200 um, public events. I'm talking A&P shows, field days, town hall meetings. 
uh, you know, we're averaging almost 200 people coming to a meeting. And, yeah, I tell you what, when you get back to Parliament and you've spoken to a couple of thousand people just in the two-week break, uh, you get back to Parliament seeing the world through a slightly different lens from, you know, people who have spent most of the time in the beehive. And, and I think increasingly people have started to see that contrast, and, and in particular when the, the PM, um, you know, really just, just blew her whole brand. I mean, the, the global media have gone completely nuts over her calling me an arrogant prick. Uh, and um, I'm not surprised because she's held herself out to be one thing and, you know, in a few seconds showed herself to be something else. Mm. Um, as a lot of people suspected, though, I mean, if you're under pressure, uh, and that's, I guess, just thinking about that commentary, and can I say beautifully handled um, with the um, the money going to charity and the, and the framed um, hand exchange. That was really nicely handled, and I think everybody appreciated that. I, 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 when you heard that, did you think to yourself, "Aha, you are under pressure. You've tried. It, 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 the, the, it's, it's sort of like the, the, the swan with the, with the feet paddling furiously underneath, gliding serenely across the lake. Was that, was that surprising to you, or did you think, no, I've seen aspects of that um, un- anxiety before? Well, well, actually, uh, after that question, I, I, I thought maybe she's not looking so bad because the previous week she completely lost her rag uh, and called me a liar, which, as you know, is, is mm. very um, not very bad and not allowed under parliamentary <laughs> rules. Um, so, you, you know, and, and what's more, the Deputy Prime Minister got up and, and told uh, everybody that, that she didn't call me a liar, even though he was sitting right beside her when she said it. So... Um, you know, for the Prime Minister to break the rules of Parliament in a pretty bad way and the Deputy Prime Minister to then break the rules of Parliament by saying that she didn't break the rules of Parliament when he helped, which she very obviously just did. Um, that was pretty amazing. Uh, I only found out about that, that, that comment this week um, when a, a journalist who was sitting closer to her and, and actually heard me. Um, so I wasn't surprised at all. And, and really, we, we shouldn't be surprised because... You know, she's now starting to feel a lot of the frustration that people up and down the country have been feeling under her rule. I mean, you just think, just to pick one example, um, farmers. You know, if you're a farmer, you, you feed New Zealand through COVID. Actually, you're feeding about 40 million people. You're, you're New Zealand's preeminent environmentalist because you're mm. one of the only people in the country whose income next year will depend on how you look after the land this year. Um, and, it, you know, government policy makes the assumption that farmers are a bunch of nincompoops who are all trying to destroy their own property because they don't want to <laughs> make any money next year. I, I mean, it's just insane. And yet none of this stuff works. In the end, we all spend more of our time running around focusing on compliance activity rather than productive activity. We gradually get poorer. Prices rise. Um, and uh, actually, you, you know, she's starting to get frustrated too because she's it's starting to hit her in the poles. It's a long feedback loop, but she's finally feeling uh, what a lot of people have been feeling. Do you anticipate the government... Um, there was also, obviously, that speech at the end of the year in which she said to every minister publicly, basically, go and look at your portfolio and see what your priorities are next year. I think most people read that as being probably time to slow down do you did you read it that way as well? Yeah, and it goes back to what I was saying a few minutes ago, just about how you know people are frustrated with government because it's just trying to do too much stuff. And if it was us, we'd be saying, look, first of all, you got to get spending under control, take pressure off inflation, and therefore mortgage rates. Because if there's going to be a hard landing, government's got to pull back, not just households and firms. Um, number two, uh, let's work on how you get kids to school because, frankly, you know, we can do everything else, but in 30 years' time, the only thing that really mattered today, and I, I recognise it's school holidays soon, but mm. the only thing that really mattered today is how many kids actually went to school and what did they learn because in 30 years' time, if we have an educated population that is thoughtful and knowledgeable and worldly, then I guarantee New Zealand will solve whatever problems it faces. In well, we years. certainly don't have um, that at the moment. I mean, we're sinking like a, a stone when it comes to international educational standards. You'd be aware of that. That's been happening for the last 20 years. And it's not just at um, compulsory schooling level, David. It's also in tertiary institution measurements as well. Um, well, you only have to look at 
Ashley Bloomfield becoming a professor, and as far as I can tell, he's never published an academic journal article in his name in his life. I mean, how on earth does that work? And imagine if you were a, a real academic at the University of Auckland or anywhere else for that matter, slogging away, trying to get your research published in a prestigious journal, not making professor um, in spite of that effort, and then see this guy swan in on the basis that he handled COVID well. I mean, you've got to be kidding. Yep, no, I did see that, and it is weird, but then our tertiary institutions are very much, um, they are very much petty fiefdoms of their own, aren't they? Don't they also need reform, David? Well, yeah, I mean, sheesh, I, you know, when I was at the University of Auckland, it was the 45th best university in the world. Good example. Um, yep. yep, it's been falling down the yep. down the rankings. Yeah. Um, and I just learned that in 2025, um, every uh, student at the University of Auckland will do a foundational course in Mataranga Māori. Oh, you're joking. In other words, no, ma- no matter what you're studying, uh, you'll be forced to look back to a period in New Zealand history when we didn't have written language or the wheel, uh, and that's what we have to look for knowledge. Um, and it's actually insulting to Māori, and I find it insulting, uh, because no other culture in New Zealand... Uh, is forced to look at, at that particular period of its history um, and put it on a pedestal. Uh, it's it's just a, it's just an exercise in patronising. Sorry, I, I haven't I haven't read this. Uh, sorry, so David, uh, uh, this is uh, when did the story break? I'm sorry, I, I'm not aware of it. Every student well, you're saying at Auckland University will need to do a compulsory course in Matauranga Maori, whether they're studying engineering, broadcasting, or medicine. Is that what you're saying to me? Yep, I don't, I, I, I don't think they're doing broadcasting, but, but engineering or medicine, and I, I tell you why I know this, because about three weeks ago, I was asked to give a speech at my alma mater to the electrical engineering uh, department or an electrical engineer, engineering conference where I study, um, and they don't often ask me to, to give me a speech, but anyway, I got, went along. Um, and um, the, the, the dean of engineering gave a speech at the beginning, and... Um, uh, he wasn't really talking about how we are going to have world-leading electrical engineers, but he did say that from 2025, every student at the University of Auckland will do a foundation course in Master Ranga oh, Um So, so I, assume that, I assume the dean of the engineering school, if he says knows that... Knows what he's saying, he, yeah. He, 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 yep. Yeah. Um, and I was yeah pretty, pretty astonished. I don't know what the course content will be. Um, but, you, you know, what what could it be? It, it can either be from the modern world where Maori people, including myself, participates at the forefront of human knowledge, in which case it's just the same as everyone else, um, or it will be drawn from a period between about 1300 and 1700 um, when New Zealand did not have written language. Uh, why, why we would draw on that period um, to celebrate and, and sort of hang Maori on, on that period a hat on that period, um, I don't know, but, but that's what we're facing, and this is what was one of the top 50 universities in the world, uh, now makes four professors out of people that have never published a paper. It's, it, it's actually, I, I mean, I'm personally pissed off because it's devaluing my degrees. Yes, I know. Um, I went to Otago University, so I'm looking at um, oh. my degree. Well, who, who would have who who thought that would be a good investment, but there you go. Well, actually, at the time, um, it was it would rival Auckland, and it was um, you had two in the top one hundred. Okay. Now, can I, I just say that? Well, but here's a stat I often quote, David. Um, we've got one university in the top two hundred now ranked in the world, and that's Auckland. Um, mm. Australia have got eight in the top hundred. So th- mm. that that mm. contrast is remarkable. And how long before New Zealanders seeking to educate themselves? to a higher and better level, simply desert New Zealand or we lose our best and brightest students to those Look, universities I can, as well. I can, I can tell you, I mean, I'm a member of Parliament for <coughs> Epsom and, and some of, well, many of New Zealand's top 10 schools are, are in the Epsom electorate. I'm talking about yeah. Auckland Grammar, St Cuthbert's, Tyo, you know, Epsom Girls and, and so on, Baradeen. Um, and um, I can tell you, talking to young people now, they, uh, I mean, when, when I was there, and no doubt when you uh, were around, um, you, you know, basically, if you were exceedingly bright, you know, if you were the ducks of Auckland Grammar, maybe you'd go to Cambridge or Oxford. Um, but for the most part, the question was, well, you know, you're going to Auckland or Victoria or Otago or maybe the 
I mentioned Victoria, uh, Canterbury. Um, you, you know, they were good universities. They were as good as any in the world. Why, why the hell would you leave? Um, now, uh, you, you know, young people at the, at the top of their game uh, are looking at a, a, a global picture or at least an Australasian picture. Uh, and you've got the likes of um, Crimson Consulting, who, whose whole business specialises in getting kids out of New Zealand universities. It's, uh, it's a real problem. And we're going to have to return to uh, transferring valuable academic knowledge from one generation to the next, or we will face a future where the next generation of New Zealanders are less educated than the last for the first time in our history. And, and we will have to question whether the first world status is still within reach of New Zealand. Uh, well, yeah, it's something we've talked about a lot on the show this year. I have to say, um, we share your concerns over that one. And I think we've almost answered that question, sadly, too. Listen, um, looking ahead to next year, you've, it's obviously election year. You're, a lot of your focus and prime focus will be going on that. Um, is there any other legislation that's coming into the House that you expect to have the same level of contention as, for example, the Three Waters or the Water Entities Bill this year? Uh, well, bear in mind that Three Waters is not over. There's a further two pieces of legislation that were introduced and passed first reading uh, before Parliament rose last week. Uh, those two are now out for consultation. One of them sets up, guess what, a new commissioner at the Commerce Commission to manage the price charged by the new water service entities. Now, this is interesting. Uh, if they're democratic, then surely uh, people will just elect people that control the prices, just like we currently do. Uh, if they're not democratic, then they might need uh, a Commerce Commission regulator. So what we've got is more centralisation, more bureaucracy and less democracy. So that's number one bill. Number two bill is the one that actually sets out, well, now these entities exist, which assets exactly are transferred to their ownership? Um, and that is going to be an absolute bun fight because when you talk about three waters, and particularly when you talk about stormwater, well, if you get a lot of overland flow on your farm, is that three waters? Is mm. that stormwater? Mm. Mm. Uh, you know, what, what's the difference between a bit of flooding in your paddock and, and an actual drainage channel like a river? Um, th th that's going to have to be decided. Uh, and, and that is going to be potentially bigger than the water services entity. So um, the answer is yes, and it, it's not because three waters is over. It's actually just beginning, in my view. Um, I, I don't, I, I'm not aware of other legislation that the fair pay agreement that's going to be hugely damaging if they press ahead with the unemployment insurance i mean that is just an additional tax on working and an additional benefit for not working as if we already you know didn't have good incentives in new zealand that we're going to try and make that worse but i don't think it will be it's stupid but i don't think it'll be constitutionally divisive um, so, look, I, I think probably it will stick with three waters, but who knows with these guys, uh, anything could happen. What about um, the merger of Radio New Zealand TV and Z? Do you think that's dead now or not? Well, you'd hope so, but, I mean, you know, these guys are able to push on with something uh, long past its use-by date and long past the edge of reason. So, um, you know, the, the Nats are saying it's dead, um, but, I mean, they're, they're sort of, putting a lot of trust in, in Labor to say that. Uh, so let, let's just see where, where that gets to. Um, I, I think probably the best point that's been made in this area was actually by Stephen Joyce, who, who pointed out something very uh, obvious that I, I wish I'd picked up on myself, and it's just the fact that, you know, TV3 and the various radio stations, um, whether it's, you know, the, the, the Rock or, or what's now but now your old old station, um, they were merged, a radio TV merger in the private sector. Um, they tried it for 20 years. They could never make it work. And in the end, the commercial decision was to break up the radio from the TV so they could operate separately. Mm. Uh, it's, it's amazing that 20 years later, the government is attempting to repeat their mistake. I, I just think this is crazy. So, uh, look, it, it is crazy, but well, who knows if they'll power on with it. The other thing I should mention, um, and I'm very proud of what X done in this area, we've published uh, you know, a 20-page uh, booklet summarising how we would do resource management reform based on property rights. Um, but you've still got these resource management, or what they're calling now the Natural and Built Environments Act. Yeah. Um, and this requires all planning decisions to take into account te oranga o te taio. Now, 
nobody knows what that means, and I, I literally mean that the, the courts. No, are you're right. Spend you're 15, right. Yeah. The, the courts. The courts will spend fifteen years working out what that means. Absolutely. And in the meantime, uh, our living standards will just fall back further while nothing gets done. No, I know. I sit on a regional council, as you're aware, and. Um and we have to interpret that. We haven't got a clue. So it's one of the submissions we've just put. <laughs> we've just actually put our submission on that and said, we don't know what this means. Define it for us. Because we can't well, possibly implement a, something few, that has no definition. Look, for a few billion dollars, mm. the planning profession, the lawyers uh, and the courts uh, will, will find out just a few billion dollars and a decade or so and you'll be good to go. Yeah, that's right. Um, finally, um, I'm also interested in you personally. What are you doing for Christmas? Uh, sleeping. <laughs> no, I don't blame you. That no, my, my, my family's from the north, so um, I'll, I'll be, be keen to go up to the beach um, and uh, just read a few things. Um, I've been trying to read a book all week called, all year, sorry, called Stolen Focus. Um, it's by Johan Hari. It's a, a brilliant book so far as I can tell from reading the first four chapters. But the, the book is all about um, how people get distracted and don't finish things. So I'm determined to, <laughs> I'm, I'm, determined, <laughs> I'm determined to finish the book by the end of the year. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's almost a satire. Um, listen, have a great Christmas. Thank you so much for being a guest on our show and for giving us your insight and your time this year. We wish you well hey. and um, we'll catch up with you in the new year, mate. Yeah, no worries, and congratulations to you guys. I mean, it's it's bloody difficult starting anything new, especially a media platform in the in the current climate. And I think you guys, just based on the number of people that come to our meetings and, and say they've been listening, I think you guys have done a fantastic job. So good on you. Thank you so much, David. Have a good Christmas. Um, that is David Seymour, the ACT Party leader, heading off to a well-earned Christmas, I'd have to say. Um, he has appeared... Um, prominently in our person of the year we'll be counting all these up tomorrow and um, letting you know who you nominate as person of the year this year um, Mike King is another uh, Sean Plunkett is even there I've got, I don't know, I don't know how that happens but there's no Michael Laws though I don't, I don't understand it but there you go um, but yes the, all those persons of the year, villain of the year boy it's coming down to for a wee while it looked like a three person race at the moment one person has just hived out into grand view, despite, I don't think, even living in this country anymore.